life sciences are gradually being dominated by big data. By 2025, it is expected that the genomes of one billion people will have been sequenced. In other words, we are likely to generate somewhere between 2 and 40 billion gigabytes of genome data within the next decade. And that's only the human genome data. Life sciences can nowadays also obtain measurements on millions of proteins, metabolites, and their interactions. To make sense of enormous volumes of complex data, interdisciplinary researchers are needed to combine knowledge from biology, computer science, and statistics, forming an essential component of modern-day life science research this field is known as bioinformatics. One place where this work is carried out is at the Utrecht Bioinformatics Center. Studying the right data can lead to truly groundbreaking discoveries. By analyzing millions of DNA sequence fragments through high-performance computing, we were able to bring to light new unknown organisms. By identifying the 0.1% of a human genome that differs from person to person, we can explain just why two people never look the same. And by predicting the structures of proteins in a cell, we are beginning to understand why some of us get sick while others live long, healthy lives. These are the reasons why Utrecht Science Park promotes the sharing of bioinformatics expertise and the combining of different disciplines. Together, life sciences and big data can help us address the challenges of tomorrow. Hello everyone, another day, another discussion for all of you. So. Um, I would like to introduce myself first. I am Sean and I am a scientist specialized in human microbiome and I am together with Christopher and Charles, my co-scientists, and later you will discover what they are specialized on. And going back to the discussion, um, I, I believe we will be discussing bioinformatics for today. So I hope you are excited because we are very excited to discuss everything to you in a brief and concise and an understandable way so i think you're guys ready yes so now let's go to the discussion so i think now you can now see the powerpoint presentation in your screens so before anything else i would like um to give the overview core concepts of our discussion. First, the history and definition of bioinformatics, bioinformatics and health informatics, the difference between those two, sequencing, microbial genome application, genome assembly and examples, leveraging graph, single cell data set, gene production and annotation, human microbiome, bioinformatics, combining biology, with computer science, and last, the advantages of detecting mutations with next-generation sequencing. Now, who termed the bioinformatics, no? So, in 1970, Dutch biologists Pauline Hogeweg and Ben Hasper published Bioinformatica, and they used the term bioinformatics for the research that they wanted to do defining it as the study of informatic processes in biotic system so as you can see here ben hesper doesn't have any photo i've done my research i've done my research very well but i still couldn't find a photo of him so i think he remains mysterious until up to this day but the good thing is even if um ben hesper was not like revealed um, Pauline Hogeweg uh, still credited that bioinformatics was the work of them both you now because there are some instances that this certain um, scientists would not credit other people na naging in I mean na involved sa kanyang invention or something you know? so it's a good thing that 
kahit hindi siya na-reveal, he's still there, he's still, uh, he is still credited to for bioinformatics. And I think, again, sinabi ko kanina na bioinformatics really help us even the different disciplines. So, yes. Now, let's proceed to the history and definition of bioinformatics. Bioinformatics is defined as the application of tools of computation and analysis to capture and interpret biological data. So, in an easier manner, um, if we have a, a situation wherein ang, ang, ang father is, he wants to confirm the identity that this specific person is really his son. So, everyone, what do you think will he do? Para ma-confirm na anak niya talaga yun. Yes, you are right. He needs to do DNA test. But this DNA test, do you think it would happen? Or I mean, do you think this is possible without um technology? Maybe yes or maybe no. So I think... Um, siguro possible siya, but it is a very long process if we do it manually. But if the, uh, but if we have um, bioinformatics, we have the technology of storing data and such things. It would be easier for them to know that it is really sun in an accurate manner. No, so that is bioinformatics. Bioinformatics really help us to certain disciplines, even with science, mathematics, physics, and biology. I believe most of you already encountered these terms, but to give a clarification, bioinformatics and health informatics are different from each other. Let me define you again, bioinformatics. Bioinformatics is the study of information in biological data. While health informatics is the study of information in patient care. So, for bioinformatics, biological sciences, um, health informatics, patient care. So, you can see the difference between them? So, I think you do. Now, let's proceed. Diba, sinabi ko kanina na um, bioinformatics help or um, is significant to different fields, not just in biological sciences, but also to mathematics, physics, and even chemistry, you know? So to give you the list of the following fields, you can see there on your screens from microbial genome applications to veterinary sciences. So yes, bioinformatics is really important, not just in um, biological sciences, but to these fields too. Hello everyone, my name is Christopher Inoales and I am a scientist specialized with the microbial genome applications and later on we will discuss the de novo assembly. So first, microbial genome applications is simply the uh, applications of a microbial genome, so which is the majority of microbial genomics consists of identif identifying and describing their genetic compositions. So the mother bi bioinformatics is built on the ability to process and analyze genomic de data gathered from the microbial organisms such as the such genome assembly and resequencing. So now let's, uh, let's discuss with the uh, de novo assembly. So de novo assembly it is a, uh, an annotation product. It is the, the nucleotide sequence of a genome is first assembled. So as a completely as a possible, it is then annotated. So the function of it is process is in first the structure and assemble the sequences such as protein coding genes and the it is annotated first and also the presence of regulatory or repetitive sequence. So what is de novo assembly? So de novo assembly is a method <coughs> for constructing <coughs> genomes from a large number or um, DNA fragments um, from short or long or long or short. So with no priority knowledge, of the correct sequence or the dose fragments. So the, there are lots of a <clears throat> the steps for having a de novo assembly which can be identified later on. So the first is reads. So identify the reads. So reads are the DNA fragments. So from the short reads, it is typically ranges at 35 to 1000 um, BPR 
base pairs, nucleotide base pairs. So long reads, while long reads, our typical range is 1,000 to 500,000 base pairs. So <clears throat> the first step is overlapping reads are assembled into one or more contains. So as you can see in the image, so there are lots of reads. So it is aligned and being sequenced wherein the overlapping are wherein the overlapping reads are assembled into one. So second is contigs. So contigs are a set of overlapping oriented reads. So a single contig is constructed from two or more overlapping R oriented reads. So as you can see in the image, in the contig assembly step, reads must overlap by a minimum number of base pairs or keymers. So in the in the image we have contig one, contig two, and contig three. So <clears throat> the meaning of contig is contiguous. So meaning they are um, assembled by a minimum number of base pairs or the k-mers so before they can map be together so the third one is the scaffold so scaffold is a set of joint oriented contigs so from the last contig so the single scaffold is constructed from two or more oriented contigs so as you can see in the image in the de novo processes so in the scaffold assembly step contigs do not necessarily have to overlap so as you can see the scaffold one and scaffold two have a gap and the scaffold three will um um fill the gap or in it not cl really close with the um, scaffold one and scaffold two so contigs do not necessarily have to overlap in order to be joined together so this can be attributed to pair and sequence so and the last one is due to the cro with the help of the gap fill, so the chromosomes can be um can be finished process. So chromosomes can the join together of the scaffolds will be the genome finishing or the closing chromosome process. So chromosomes are set of joint oriented scaffolds. So a single chromosome is constructed from two or more and oriented scaffold. So as you can see in the de novo process, so from the reads, so it is assembled um, as a contigs, then from the contigs, so it is aligned, the, over, the overlapping reads is aligned, so it's called contigs. So from the contigs, it can be assembled is a scaffold. So from one, from contig one, contig two, and contig three, so they can, the they align first so that they can be assembled as a scaffold then the scaffold can be as if assembled as a scaffold one scaffold one scaffold three and due to the gap fill or the to get um joining with the gap filling the or the gap closing the chromosome can be made or the genome finishing finishing process so that is how the de novo assembly um um, process occurred. <clears throat> so there are lots of um, challenges with regards to the assembly or the um, types of assembly just as genome assembly um, such as um, de novo assembly and uh, many things. So um, now we uh, let's discuss the um, challenges with these kinds of assembly. So first is the presence of repeat. So when we say repeat, so due to the um, complex or uh, complexity of the nature of genomes, so we have the pre um the more repeats of the validations because um repeats are identical sequences that occur in the genome in different locations and are often seen in varying lengths and in multiple copies. So <clears throat> there are several types of repeats, just such as tandem repeats or intercepted interspersed interspersed repeats so the reads originating from different copies of the repeat appear identical to the assembler causing errors in the assembly so the more repeat it's a um of a genome sequence is <clears throat> the more it become um having a presence of repeats or having of become of ha having e errors so that's the first one so the second one is the contaminants in samples or um in the samples just uh just like bacteria and or from humans and also is the pcr bias and artifact formations just as um, mutations just like that and also um the fourth one is the sequencing error or the homopolymers errors when just runs the same base and such things and also the multiple indexes or the mids which is the serves as the Row reads and also it is a primers or adapters are still 
in the raw reads. So, last one is um polyploid genome. So, when you say polyploid genome, so it um being attached or being um from the presence of the reads, which is um can cause many errors. So, the polyploid, polyploid genomes um it can have their um uncertainty with the um the result of the aligned <clears throat> sequence of the genomes. Hello, my name is Christopher Inojales and I am a scientist specialized in weed assembly algorithms. So what is assembly algorithms? Um, it is a genome assembly algorithms are sets of well-defined procedures of reconstructing large DNA um, sequences from a large numbers of to shorter DNA sequence fragments. So the fragments are aligned against one another and overlapping sections are under IR identified and merged. So basically, um, assembly algorithms are from the words assembled, it is um, the overlaps or the overlapping sections or the um, merging sections are being combined or being just um, um, merged in just one. So the algorithms of it is the, from the reads. So we have the provided the algorithms of the reads. So it is composed of basically um, many reads um then from the inner go the, the sequencing through overlaps where can overlap uh, through sequencing where overlaps can be identified so after the overlaps can be identified then it will be the the reads will be connected by the overlaps and then it can be se sequenced again then after the sequence it can undergo it will undergo the <clears throat> Hamilton Hamiltonian Hamiltonian pass um identified were in the consensus consensus sequence identified were in the it's composed of the overlapping sections and the uh, um such frag sequence fragments were being aligned and merged hello there my name is charles and i'm a data analyst and also a scientist specialized in softwares is for genome sequencing today we'll be talking about the brain graph single cell data set speeds pipeline, and lastly, gene production and annotation. So without further ado, let's get into it. First, we will be talking about the De Bruyne graph. In 1940s, a Dutch mathematician called Nicolas De Bruyne became interested in finding the shortest circular string of characters that contains all possible substrings, each of the same length, in a given alphabet. The solution he came up with involved constructing a graph with all possible k to 1 mers as nodes. A De Bruyne graph is also a directed graph defined over a dimension n and a set S of m symbols. The set of vertices in this graph corresponds to the m and possible sequences of symbols with length n. Symbols can be also be repeated. The De Bruyne graphs are key data structures for the analysis of next generation sequencing data. They efficiently represent the overlap between reads and hands, also the underlying genome sequence. However, sequencing errors and repeated subsequences render the identification of the true underlying sequence difficult. Short read sequencing technologies produce very large number of reads, which currently favors the use of the De Bruyne graphs. De Bruyne graphs are also well suited to representing genomes with repeats, whereas overlap methods need to mass repeats that are longer than the read length. To further understand the De Bruyne graph, Here's a video, for example, for you to better understand this topic. First, the sequences are broken up into fragments of a specified k length. A de Bruyne graph is then constructed from the total set of k-mers from all of the sequences, providing a way to represent relationships between the entire set of sequences without pre-calculating the overlaps between them. The most common use of a de Bruyne graph is for sequence assembly where pass through the de Bruyne graph can be identified and then used to assemble longer sequences that represent the original content of the genomes in the sample. These assembled sequences can then be analyzed in a variety of ways, providing information about what organisms are present in a community and what genes they have. The next one we'll be talking about is about single cell sets. Single cell datasets retrieves a selected dataset from the database server and sends the data to the output. Gene expression datasets include cells in rows and genes in columns. 
the data set file is downloaded to the local memory and for subsequent requests, instantly available even without the internet connection. So, what does the single cell data sequencing literally mean? Well, it is a technology that refers to the sequencing of a single cell genome or transcriptome. So, as to obtain genomic transcriptome or other multi-omics information to reveal cell population differences and cellular evolutionary relationships. Single cell analysis plays a critical importance in revealing population heterogeneity, identifying minority subpopulations of interest, as well as discovering unique characteristics of individual cells. Microfluidic platforms work at a scale comparable to cell diameter and is suitable for single cell manipulation. Lastly, we'll be talking about gene production and annotation. While well, using gene annotation approaches, the genes or proteins that may be recruited by a particular genome sequence can be predicted. Functional annotation of these new genes or proteins can be done by searching their similarity with well experimentally verified sequences available in the databases. What, what is meant by gene annotation? Well, DNA annotation or genome annotation is a process of identifying the location of genes in all of the coding regions in a genome and determining what those genes do. An annotation, respective of the context, is a note added by the way of explanation or commentary. How does gene annotation work? Well, it consists of three main steps, identifying portions of the genome that do not code for proteins, identifying elements of the genome, a process called gene prediction, and attaching biological information to these elements. Well, what does this basically mean? Well, it is a process that identify the locations of genes and all of the coding regions in a genome and determining what those genes do. It's also a multi-level process that includes prediction of protein coding genes as well as other functional genome units such as structural RNAs, tRNAs, small RNAs, pseudogenes, control regions, direct and in the inverted repeats, insertion sequences, transposons, and other mobile elements. And lastly, why is genome annotation important? Well, it is a no simple fit, but it's incredibly important in identifying the functional elements of DNA. Building the appropriate tools and pipeline is the key. It's also essential because the sequencing of the genome or DNA generates sequence information without its functional role. After the genome is sequenced, it must be annotated to bring more logical information about its structural features in functional roles. If you're having a hard time understanding what is gene production and annotation, well, here's a video that will show you how to better understand this topic. This diagram I've created shows the process of genome annotation from a visual perspective. As you can see at the top, the genome sequence consists of a list of DNA bases, C, G, T, and A. Through the process of genome annotation, this DNA sequence is converted into the display seen below. From this, you can see much more about the position of key elements within the genome, such as the enhancer, the promoter site, the location of exons or introns, and repeat regions. This process is the only way to really understand the genome environment of an organism, because without it, you would not be able to identify any genetic elements from looking at the genome sequence alone. Hello, I'm Shan again, your scientist that is specialized in human microbiome. So I am really interested to discuss this topic to you. So I hope na kayo rin ay interesado na pakinggan ako. So let's start. Okay, so what is microbiome? We humans are mostly microbes, over 100 trillion of them. So sabi dito na ang ating katawan ay mayroong. 100 trillion, imagine trillion na microbes. Tapos, ang microbes daw ay nag a number ng human cells into 10 to 1. The ratio is 10 to 1. And the majority live in our gut, particularly in our large intestine. And the microbiome is the genetic material of all the microbes, the bacteria, fungi, protozoa, and viruses that live on inside 
our body. And the number of genes in all the microbes in one person's microbiome is 200 times the number of genes in the human genome. Imagine 200 times, no? And the microbiome also weigh, um, weigh as much as five pounds. Imagine the five pounds. If you convert it to kilogram, solve it. Now, the bacteria in the microbiome help us um, helps us to digest the food that we eat and regulate our immune system, protect against other bacteria that can cause disease, and produce vitamins that is needed in blood coagulation. And that's all for the definition of microbiomes. Now, what does human microbiome have to do with our health? And to answer that question, number one, the microbiome is essential for human development, immunity, and nutrition. Sabi dito na ang microbiome ay tumutulong sa pagdevelop ng ating body. Number two, the bacteria living in and us are not invaders, which means na hindi lang sila nag invade but they are beneficial colonizers, which means uh, tumapasok sila sa body natin not to harm us but to be to have good effects sa ato Number three, autoimmune diseases such as diabetes are associated with dysfunction in microbiome. So yung mga diabetic person ay may dysfunction ang kanilang microbiome. Maybe it's not normal, that's why they got that autoimmune disease. And disease-causing microbes accumulate, accumulate over time, changing gene activity and metabolic processes and resulting in an abnormal immune response against substances and tissues normally present in the body. Diba? Yun ang sinabi ko. Siguro, itong mga persons with diabetes, hindi naman ako uh, specialized doon, but siguro because the, meron dysfunction sa kalilang um, uh, microbiome, siguro yung pag-function ng uh, uh, microbiome, diba, sabi sa first is uh, human development daw, I mean, sa ating body. But because meron dysfunction, um, of course, it will cause na mag-resist din yung, yung immune system natin certain things. So, yes. And lastly, autoimmune diseases appear to be passed in families not by DNA inheritance, but by inheriting the family's microbiome. So, itong autoimmune diseases daw ay hindi galing sa DNA ng ating family, but galing sa microbiomes ng ating family. So, imagine for like, for siguro iniisip nyo na pag may sakit, siguro pag iniisip nyo na genetic DNA agad, but no, but no, because sabi dito na ang mga autoimmune disease daw ay galing sa microbiomes, hindi sa DNA. So, yun lang po, at magbibigyan ko ng example after. So, for the examples, um, we can read here that the gut microbiome is different between obese and lean twins. Obese twins have a lower diversity of bacteria and higher levels of enzymes, meaning the obese twins are more efficient at digesting food and harvesting calories. And obesity has also been associated with a poor combination of microbes in the gut. And another one is Fecal microbiota transplantation or FMT is a clinical procedure that restores healthy bacteria in the colon by introducing stool by colonoscopy or enema from a healthy human donor. Potentially fetal uh, clostridium difficile infections which is CDI have been cured using FMT to restore healthy gut microbiota. So, ginamit to nilang FMT to restore the microbes, the good microbes. Uh, FMT is also used to treat colitis, constipation, and irritable bowel syndrome. So, that's for the that is all for the examples of human microbiome. So, I hope no na uh, na nakalearn kayo na something about human microbiome that our body is consists of human microbiome and second is that is that not all diseases comes from DNA but maybe it comes from 
my kabaya. So, yun lang po at maraming salamat. So, what happens with the bioinformatics um, in collaboration with biology and computer science? So, first and foremost, one of the most up and coming fields in biosciences is the bioinformatics, which is the interdisciplinary the, or field that combines with the biology and computer science. So, what is in bioinformatics is? Um, it's discussed in the um, previous topic and also as a recap, it is um, responsible for several important arenas like analyzing the variations and expressions in the human gene and also it uses it uses data to analyze such protein sequences genome sequences and other sequences so there are lots of advantages of bioinformatics um, with the help of the computer science and biology and one one is that is it is um can explore the causes um of diseases at the molecular level so what is what what is the meaning of a um, molecular liver? So we all know that um in a genome sequencing in sequencing is um a lot of complex of genomes of natures that will um have um considerably as a dilemma of uh, some scientists or microbiologists. And also it can make um the use of the computer techniques will help to analyze and interpret the data faster. So they can um, create the data, they can <clears throat> analyze and also they um, they can interpret it you know, quickly with the help of the technology. So also the last is it improved the, the drug discovery we need to discover. So we have the red developed, so it is efficient for the bioinformatics algorithms and the approaches to target identifications, validations, and also it can lead the optimizations of the gene sequencing and other types of potent sequencing. So advantages of the mutation, detecting mutations together with NGS. So first, it is um throughput, high throughput, as I said earlier, and also it is a cost efficient because it is efficient. Um, the percentage of the um the use of this kind of sequencing is very efficient to those um scientists, biologists, and other fields of the sciences. So also it is um systematic or unbiased mutations detection of all mutation types. So the second is it, it tests many genes at once. So unlike the genome sequencing, it can be only one, one because of the different um, complex of um, genomes. But here in the NGS or the <clears throat> next generation sequencing, um, the different genes can be tested um, in just one, um, we um, would we say, karang, um, pwede lang po siyang maging test at once. So hindi po siya Kumbaga, hindi siya systematic ng isa-isa lang. So, we have lots of um, disadvantages and there is massively parallel sequencing capability. And so, as I said, single input DNA of under our RNA. And also, um, it has a better picture of um, such heterogeneity. So, unlike with uh, some assembly or the sequencing, um, it is more advanced. The NGS is more advanced, more, um, more flexible because it has decreased the sequencing cost per gene. So, if the other sequencing is more higher than the GNGS, it's more efficient than where it can be cost effective. And also it is um constantly improving technology. So um besides of all the advantages in the NGS or the next generation sequencing, we have these um disadvantages also. So number one is high complexity of workflow and results. So the more you <clears throat> because it is um tested at once, so it has a lot of workflow and results to be um wait and also it requires through a validation of assay performance per guidelines and also it is um the the revalidation of upgrades is very evident because because it is tested at once so there are lots of um genes that cannot be um aligned or cannot be sequenced um correctly so it is um high of upgrades or revalidations and also since it is um, single input DNA or RNA, the long-term storage of a retrieval of data is very, very long. That's why it can cause um, um, such time consuming and also high complexity of workflow. So that's all. To end this discussion about bioinformatics, I want you to watch this video. 80%, that's how similar our protein coding genes are to those of mice. 
Humans are larger, smarter, and live longer than mice. Not to mention the fact that humans don't have fur or a tail. The reason we have been able to calculate our similarity to mice is because of a massive effort to sequence the genomes of humans, an undertaking called the Human Genome Project, as well as from sequencing the genomes of mice and many other organisms. Genome sequencing involves reading through the A's, T's, G's, and C's that make up our DNA. And it has given us a lot of information about what our genes are and how they are organized. And it has helped us improve how we diagnose and even treat human disease. But genome sequencing involves generating very large sets of data, so we need powerful tools to decipher all those A, T, G, C's. This is where the rapidly growing field of bioinformatics comes in. Extremely powerful computers are being used to store and manipulate all of this data. And the people behind the computers are bioinformaticians, scientists who are often trained both in biology as well as math or computer science. These multidisciplinary researchers develop methods and software tools to program computers to dig through and make sense of all of this data. On behalf of my co-scientists, I would like to say thank you to every one of you for listening and for enjoying the whole discussion. And I hope and we hope that you have learned something about bioinformatics.